And uh, so, JD, good morning. Good morning, Sam. Uh, today, I'm going to get, start talking fa- right, right away without playing very much music, and I don't know how much music will fit in because we've got a couple of guests about the Neo Replicants show, which uh, which you saw last week here in here in the Phoenix. Yes, we did. It's 3D printing. Yes. It's sculpture. Yes. I thought it was made out of marshmallows, but uh, I mm. won't go into that. No. <laughs> it's some sort of plastic, isn't it? Or nylon. Is it? Oh, right. Sort of um, lay- layers of nylon, white nylon. Right. I think is what it's, what it's made of. Right. And I don't know if the listeners had a chance to see it yet, but it, it's here till the 19th of January. Mm-hmm. So I think we can we can talk about it a lot, a lot today, and then whatever's left over, we can talk again mm-hmm. as, as it goes on. Right. And um, we've got two two people coming in today. F- Fabian, who'll be in about half past ten, who does scanning. He's he's got a business that scans. It looked very interesting on the website. You had you had a look. Yes. I'm yeah, I should say on the on the fa- on our Facebook page, the Wild Show yeah. Facebook page, we got we got a link uh, to some YouTube clips that he's done, which mm-hmm. shows shows how he builds models. Right. And um, then Nick, who's who's just down the the corridor from us here in the basement at the phoenix so we're we running a microphone into his workshop no well, i'm gonna go and get him <laughs> I, I think <laughs> we will good sheet <laughs> we'll we, we might we might do that another day if he's very busy but um no yes, i think can, he can he can come along the corridor there yeah and um he's got some work in the in the show which is a font and uh it, it's it is available to download from his from his website as well. So it's a it's an open font, and um, I think that's very interesting because it's an example of something being uh, shiftable outside the gallery so that other people can look at it. Right. And I think that's relevant to this idea of, of printing um, because these are these are works of sculpture. They are in a gallery, but at the same time they've been printed. So the the could in theory be many of them uh if that was if that was thought suitable all right and so i i hope we'll talk a little bit about copyright and um social media and how the web is working it and so forth because with 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 music jd we we're allowed as radio quite a lot of liberty in what we do with it don't yeah. you think uh yes but there is a barrier there is a barrier where is the barrier the barrier is is not to uh, offend people in any way, whether it's swearing, you know, racism, or anything like that. So, yeah, we we have a slight bit of a barrier. So there's a limitation on what we do. Yes, but we, by virtue of that, get can reach a large audience potentially. Yes, yes very large audience, and. Also, the music business is is prepared to let us use their content. Yes, as as much as possible. Yes. And I don't know that the gallery world or the fine art world is in in the same uh, position at the moment. No, that's a bit personal, isn't it? The the art world is, is the artist, so you have to have permission from the artist. You do. Yes. Whereas music goes through copyright and what have you. And the performing arts, or the PB, PPS. Well, we'll we'll get we'll get we'll get there. Um, we'll get to all these issues later on. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm I'm going to play some music. So this is um, this is D- Dion Warwick, and she's um, she's reworking one one of her own songs. This is this isn't her current album. We will get to her current album later, but I th- I think this is from a previous reworking of a previous song. So this this is Dion Warwick. So uh, that was One Nation Under a Groove, which has been sampled. There are different versions of that one. Uh, we're, we're just starting out looking, looking at music and what, what we can do with it. Um, Fabian King is, is here, but we're going to start talking to him after, after this, next, uh, this next track, which is The Pirates, because um, I noticed that they don't put as much on YouTube as they used to. I think they are trying to sell their CD and um, not putting as many tracks up for free. I'm not sure about this, but this is this is possible. Um, this is a track called Chicken on a Raft, which is a, a previous version of the Pirates. Thing is, they tried to swim ashore, sailing down along the coast of High Barbary. Ah! Oh, this is an 
next track is um, by Keith Richards, all by himself. Just, uh, I think it was this week, the Rolling Stones had their 50th uh, anniversary concert. So this is Keith, all by himself, showing that he's uh, just about the best um, Chicago blues player since uh, Johnson. And the first track is Big Enough. Well, what I like about it is um, Bill Johnson, who was the, the Chicago blues player that came to prominence and sadly died in his early 20s, um, he really set the pace and Keith Richards picked that up um, at the same sort of time that he, he met um, Mick Jagger. And um, Mick Jagger always <laughs> sort of stole the show with his singing, but in the background Keith Richards was really driving the music and this is him, the whole album's all by himself. And I just love it. I love it. You know, if you, if you just listen to the rhythms going on behind, and Keith's just totally into it. This was recorded um, uh, a couple of years after he came off rather um, a bad addiction to heroin, and um, he's uh, he just resurfaced and came himself, and he's he's just fantastic. I love the music. So, do do you think the the early Stones is is mostly cover versions, or do what variation did they do in the first few years? In the first few years, they, they, well, very early on when they were um, playing, uh, was it Eel Pie Island? I can't remember, but um, they started fairly early on to, to realise that they had to produce their own music to make their mark. And um, uh, they, 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 they were a mirror of, I guess, the Beatles, but had to be different. And then The Who came along being the third part of the triangle. Um, so there were these genres which were playing off each other a bit, and the Rolling Stones, um, they just let free, um, and, and they found their own genre. It's just fantastic. So do, do you think the, the copyright arrangements with blues, which were a bit loose at that time, did that help? That's very interesting, isn't it? Now, the copyright, I think, um, was all... The copyright issues as a sort of a, an imposition came in with the record recording companies, didn't they? Um, they they dominated the scene, and I think that, and if you, some might not remember, but um, there was a scandal called Payola, yeah. whereby you had the Top of the Pops um, record, which sort of told people what they should listen to, and that caused the shops to stop those records, and they they didn't have much else, so you had to choose from what was in in the top ten, or the top fifty, or whatever, and. Uh, I think people then vied with each other as to whether they had bought them or not in their collection. Um, it wasn't until the internet came along that, with with um, Apple bringing forward the ability to record your own music, that people started to get out from under the shadow of the recording companies. So the recording companies, who had big money behind them, they they I think led um, uh, on on the copyright uh, management, um, and they. They wanted to steer that. For so long as they steered it, they had enough money coming in to pay their lawyers to reinforce their position. Um, so that, that's one side, rather cynical side of it. There's another side, which is um, from the artist's point of view, and that's where um, uh, the, the Performing Rights Society comes right to the fore um, to look out for the interests of the musician. Because I mean, Keith Richards himself, um, he lost out hugely to his manager. Uh, the, the Rolling Stones, uh, their manager took all the, the royalties, set up a Rolling Stones company in the United States, which he owned entirely by himself, so all music played in the United States put money into that company which he owned, and the, the Stones didn't get any of it. So there's a lot of fiddling around between recording companies, the, the artists themselves, and the, the various companies set up by the lawyers. It was quite, quite uh, uh, a manipulated situation. Yeah, but the, that, that's interesting what you're explaining there, the history that ra radio uh, is seen as promotional for the music business. So mu radio's allowed to play around with sound. Yes, um, they, they certainly led the way, and television, I think, most of all. Um, the radio, um, they had a big influence, and then you had the pirate radios as well. You had Radio Luxembourg, which um, a lot of us... Uh, as old grey-haired people think about, um, wasn't it fantastic? Late well, at night, under the bedclothes of the radio. <laughs> well, it was. It was yeah, fantastic. It was yes. Great. Great. Yeah. And um, I think that's where we where we where we started out. I don't know about JD, but I, 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 actually, I think Luxembourg has to be explained to some some people, some of the slightly younger people. 
Um, yeah, the, air, we, the airwaves are regulated um, very strictly by the government, and you had to have a licence, and that was seen to be um, very restrictive. And uh, Luxembourg, uh, Radio Luxembourg, played across the, the borders, and um, they therefore weren't under the British government regime. And they took advertising revenue to keep them going, and they did very well. And later on, maybe eight, twelve years later, one had the pirate ship, uh, pirate radio ships um, in the North Sea. It's exciting times. <laughs>